in the classical and quantum setting. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And, uh, I thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, even though I have to admit that this uh, talk seems to be a little bit uh, off topic at this conference, but I talked to Jan about it and he said, well, it's always perfect to have something that's a little bit uh, uh, different. So this gives you actually some application of differential geometry in some uh, uh, differential geometry in some uh, different setting, namely the, dif uh, the setting of, well, statistics, information geometry, and so on. The uh, disadvantage is that I will not mention the name Cartan for a single time. I will talk at some point about connections, though, so that's at least something. Okay, so uh, here's what I uh, would like to do. Um, so uh, I would first give some basic examples uh, of what kind of things you uh, uh, are talking about when you uh, do information geometry. And then I will explain here divergences in statistics. So this is actually the link. Oops. Uh, this is a link uh, of all these two differential geometries. So that's sort of the key. And then I will uh, talk about uh, the notion of parallel measure models and talk about statistics and so forth. And then I will uh, give some brief account of uh, what's happening when you do the same thing in information geometry. Of course, I will explain uh, what that means. OK, so families of probability measure. Uh, well, there's some that you all have seen uh, from probably in high school at some point. Uh, so that's uh, the Gaussian distributions on the real line. Yeah, you have uh, the, the expectation value mu. And you have this, the sigma, which is the variance, and then you get some kind of, uh, yeah, the, some probability distribution which looks like this. So mu is sort of where the peak is, and the sigma measures how this is uh, distributed, basically. So these are all probability distributions. And uh, you can view these as being a family that's parameterized by some real number mu and some uh, positive number sigma. So it's basically uh, parameterized by the upper half plane. Okay, so that's sort of a family of measures that you've seen. So here's another example that's basically the higher dimension analogs. So these are the multivariate Gaussian distributions. Uh, so this uh, number sigma, sigma is then replaced by a positive definite symmetric uh, matrix. And then you use this quadratic form. So here in this example, this would be a one by one matrix with sigma squared in the entry. Yeah? So that's. Uh, uh, yeah, and then, then you get some, some kind of, well, this here would be very symmetric, so sigma would be multiple of the identity in this case, but you can have some stretches in different directions. So that would be another uh, thing. And again, it's parameterized by an open set, the open set of positive uh, symmetric matrices, and uh, u is then a vector. Yeah? So again, it's this kind of thing. Actually, there's, uh, the, what's really important are these uh, so-called exponential families, uh, so they, they look like you have some background measures, hx, dx, and then you multiply this, this by some function uh, theta i times some fixed measure. Yeah? Uh, so so th these thetas are sort of the parameters, so that's a typical example generalizing these Gauss distributions. And actually the a of theta only is there to make this a probability measure, because if you add the thetas, then this will no longer integrate to 1, so we have to make up for this. Uh, Okay, so that's, that's another kind of example that occurs very often. Uh, here's another example. Um, so now we talk about a finite set. Yeah? So omega and omega 1, that these are the uh, end points. And now you can actually talk about all probability measures. Uh, and they are just, so delta omega i, that's a Dirac measure uh, centered at omega i. And you multiply it by some non-negative number and for this to become a probability measure, that uh, this sum has to be a 1. Uh, and, and this, of course, you can view as the standard simplex. Yeah? You take this hyperplane in Rn plus 1, I guess, or n, yeah, okay, whatever, I mean Rn, yeah, so the n minus 1 dimensional plane, and you cut out the simplex uh, where all the entries are positive. Um, it may be trivial, but it's actually an important point. Uh, this is not a manifold. Yeah? Of course, the interior is, yeah, if, if you uh, require all the PIs to be positive, then this is a manifold. But in general, you have some boundary, you have corners, you have sort of faces of all dimensions. And you'll see why that's uh, actually 
becomes a real problem if you try to uh, generalize this. Okay, so the, these were some examples, and now let me show you what the, how the differential geometry comes into this. So first of all, uh, the, the central notion is the, the, the notion of a divergence function. So suppose we have such a families of measures, so they are measured by some open subset in Rn or some manifold even. And uh, what you want to do is you want to define some divergence function, um, and that's some kind of distance. Yeah? And uh, so what you want to have is the distance between, or the divergence between two measures in this family is always uh, non-negative, and it's zero only if these two are zero. Yeah? So that's what you expect from the distance. And the other thing that we require is if you fix a point, okay, and you let the other number vary, then according to the first, this has an absolute minimum at p is equal to p0. And this you want to be non-degenerate in the sense that the Hessian is actually positive definite. And that's all required. So you don't require symmetry, you don't require triangle inequality, you just want to have non-degenerate minimum at the diagonal. Yeah? Uh, okay, and once you have such a thing, then you can take the dual divergence. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let, let me give you some examples. Uh, so the Euclidean distance, that's sort of naive, yeah, if you regard this P and Q, like in the finite case, yeah, you regard them as vectors or at points on your simplex, you just take the Euclidean distance between them, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit more sophisticated uh, 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 distance, which is called the Hellinger distance, so that's, you take the square root of these, these are all positive numbers, so that's possible. Um, but of course, these are actually metrics in the good old sense because they, they come from norms. Now, here's one that's also very important in statistics, um, and that's not symmetric. Yeah? So, this is a Kulber Kleitner divergence, and actually, you have uh, to think about it why this thing is positive. Yeah? It's actually not so, uh, it, it really is only positive if these are probability measures, as, uh, okay, but I won't go through the calculation. Um, so this is non-symmetric, yeah, because the p here appears twice, the q only appears once, so, so uh, the p and q really play different roles. Yeah? But that's a very important divergence, and actually uh, there's the generalization of it, so you can take the f-divergence, you, uh, you need a convex function, which is uh, 0 at 1, and then you take f of q over p, so it's, here it's p over q, so this would be just the example for f equal to minus log. And that's, yeah, it's like derivative is positive, so that's, that's a convex function. Okay, so these are examples of such divergences. So what do you do with these? So suppose you have a divergence f uh, function. So let's uh, pick local coordinates on, on some manifold. So, so then you have uh, on, on u cross u, which is in this uh, product, you have some local coordinates. Okay. So here's m by m, so that's m cross m, here you have the diagonal, so that's the diagonal of m, and then you pick here some, uh, oh yeah, actually I should, so it's u cross u, yeah, you have here this diagonal, and uh, now with respect to these coordinates, let's write down the Taylor polynomial of this divergence functions, okay, at, uh, developed at a point uh, on the diagonal, okay, so at, on the diagonal the divergence is zero, constant term is gone, uh, it's a minimum, so the first order term is also gone. So the first term you encounter is the second order term, but because it's zero on the diagonal, it <coughs> actually, uh, you only have uh, terms of the form psi i minus psi j. Uh, it's like psi i1 minus psi i2. Yeah, only these uh, uh, terms occur. And then, okay, you have a certain uh, third order polynomial. And, uh, okay, it has to vanish along the diagonal, so you have one of these factors, but you can actually easily think about if it was only up to order one of this kind, then you would get, off the diagonal, you would get immediately negative values, which is not allowed. So therefore, it has to be of this form. There must be two order factors of uh, xi i1 minus xi i j, and then the third is basically free. Okay, and for some reason I call these coefficient functions which depend on the point on the diagonal, I call this gamma ijk and gamma ijk star. Okay, and then you have uh, higher order terms. All right, um, now let's uh, think about uh, what is the gij? 
Well, if you fix a point here and you go along this line, uh, then this is just the Hessian of that matrix, which I said that's required to be positive definite. So this matrix Gij is actually positive definite. Um, so that gives you a Riemannian metric. Okay? And then here these gamma Ijks, well, I use these. Right. I promise to use connections at some point. Uh, okay, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, symmetric in i and j, obviously. So I just uh, define these coefficients i, j, k, and uh, these define connections uh, uh, nabla and nabla star, and they are portion free because it's symmetric in i and j. Okay. Um, and uh, what you can then check is actually what I'm doing here. It, it, seems to depend on the choice of coordinates, but it actually does not, okay? I mean, the Hessian is defined independently, that gives you the metric, and you can think about uh, these gamma i, j, k. Uh, so, so they are well-defined uh, well metric and a well -defined, uh, two well-defined torsion-free connections uh, which depend on this divergence function. And, uh, well, okay, these coefficients are not completely unrelated because on the diagonal everything has to vanish, so they are linked somehow. And this link trans, uh, translates to this equation here, uh, and uh, that's called the duality property. So x of, uh, 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 of, of the metric is equal to... So for the levi vita connection, you would have the same connection twice here. Yeah? But actually, you have two different connections, but they can be fit in here. Like that. Okay, and this is actually the differential geometric structure that you're using, yeah? and that's called the dualistic structure. So you have a Riemannian metric, and you have two torsion-free connections, which are linked uh, to this, and a manifold with such a structure is called a statistical manifold. So if you have a divergence function on your manifold, then uh, the basically just uh, the, 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 the three jet at the diagonal determines the statistical structure on the manifold. Okay, then you can define this tensor field. So L, LC, that is the levi vita connection of G. So that is the one where uh, here you would get uh, LC, LC, and, and you would get uh, equality. And then you can rewrite this equation in this way. Yeah, so that's equal to that. Now, this, these are all tensorial, and uh, this is symmetric in X and Y, because both are torsion free. It's symmetric in X and Z, uh, so therefore it's uh, totally symmetric. So that means uh, this tensor here, which basically measures the difference between these delta and the levi vita connection, determine a symmetric 3 tensor. And, uh, well, okay, and you, you could go back. Yeah? So if you have a symmetric 3 tensor, then you define delta and delta star just by this equation, and then this is satisfied. Yeah? So, so in other words, a statistical manifold you can regard as a Riemannian manifold together with a section of the symmetric. Uh, Bundle. So you can rebuild the function? Well, not, not, not the, the function. You, you, you only use the third order jet. Yeah. Ah, I see. So it's a, yeah, yeah. You, you restructure the third, order, the third order Taylor polynomial along the diagonal, and then you can do whatever you want. It, you just have to stay positive outside the diagonal. Yeah. So the divergence function is not, it That's uses relatively little of the divergence function. Okay, so let's go back to these examples, and I told you that uh, the kuhlberg likler divergence is actually one of the most important in statistics. And if you do these calculations, then what you uh, get is the so-called Fischer-Rau metric, and it's given as this, so if u and v are your parameters, then you take the log of p and the log of q and the derivatives, and you take this integral. Yeah, that's what it turns out if you do the calculations of the distribution. You do this, and uh, this uh, tensor T, this symmetric 3 tensor, is just given in a similar form. Yeah, you just take uh, uh, the, 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 the product of three of these locks. So that's the symmetric tensor. Okay, so let's go back to the examples from the very beginning. Uh, so for the Gaussian distribution, uh, okay, taking guesses. So you have the upper half plane, it's written H2. What could the metric be? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, you just get the hyperbolic metric on H2, yeah, which is somehow surprising. It's, it's also hard to interpret what does it mean. What does it mean, for example, that, that taking a half circle is a geodesic? You know, I mean, you take a family of distributions where sort of your variance increases and decreases and your mean goes along a circle. 
uh, there are interpretation for this, but uh, that's a little bit too far-fetched to, to do this. Uh, then let's take this finite dimensional guy. And actually there you can, you can do something nice. Um, let's take here the p uh, piece of the n minus 1 sphere uh, that's, that's in the positive, uh, what's it called, or awesome, often, no, or there, or awesome, I think, yeah. So, uh, and you take this map, uh, mapping xi to the square root of it, yeah. If, if that's on the simplex, so it sums up to 1, then this here lies on the sphere. And uh, so you have this nice map, and actually what you do is you take the standard metric here on the sphere and you pull it back, and that's how you can interpret the Fisher-Brown metric. So the nice thing of this interpretation is uh, here, <laughs> close to the boundary, um, actually this develops some uh, singularities uh, because um, yeah, you have this d of log, and then if, if, uh, if, if uh, the, the function is zero, then that's no longer uh, smooth. But here, it's, it's a pullback of a smooth metric on the sphere. Yeah, it's a smooth tensor. It's just your pullback map because you take square roots. It's not smooth. Yeah, and, and so the smoothness is not the tensor, but it's, it's a map. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what that means in general. And the Amari tensor tensor, you can do in a similar way. So instead of the, I, I now need a three tensor, right? So I can't just take the metric, but I take the most stupid three tensor, symmetric three tensor on Rn that I can think of. Yeah, I just uh, multiply component-wise and sum it up. So that's sort of a, yeah. So uh, maybe it's a naive question, but this divergence function that you're using, there's some sort of, can, can they be interpreted as some uh, pseudo Fiendler metric on your? Not metric? really, not really. Uh, uh, I would have to, th I mean, they're, they're not interpreted that way. It's, you're, you're not really trying to do Finsler geometry. You, you, you're, you're saying because they don't have to be symmetric. Uh, yeah, and they, and they, they don't have to be yeah. like positive definite, but you have yeah, 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 zero yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe there are some, and you're basically using their, uh, you know, uh, osculating uh, uh, quadratic and then... Yeah, maybe, maybe there's, uh, there's new interpretation. I, I would have to think about that. Okay, uh, so, so you take uh, this sphere, uh, well, it's not a sphere, yeah, it's, it's where the sum of the cubes is equal to 1, so it would be a sort of a boiled, uh, I don't know, the deformed sphere. But you take this metric where you just take the third order root, yeah, that maps from here to here, and you take this naive tensor, and you pull it back, and that gives you the Amari tensor of tensor. Yeah, so, so you have a very nice interpretation. Okay, so these were some examples, and this link to statistical manifolds, and now I will get into, uh, so that was sort of the introduction, and uh, now I will get into the, the general definitions. So the first person who really is started uh, using differential geometric methods systematically was Amari and uh, his school in the 1980s. Um, and they basically took this heuristic uh, setting that I was described before. Well, usually you have either a finite set and then the measures are just a simplex, or you take an open domain in Rn, yeah, and then you just say, well, this should depend smoothly on, uh, you have a smooth density function and, and then you can do derivatives. Um, and uh, so he started doing this. However, there are some problems with this because sometimes you want to have, you want to also consider measures which are not smooth. You, you want to have something which is mixed. You have a smooth part and some, let's say, some Dirac measures or something of that sort. And uh, so it's in some joint work with uh, my collaborators, Nihat I from Hamburg, uh, Jürgen Joost from Leipzig and Hong Wan Le uh, from Prague, to have one of the sort of locals from here. Um, we uh, 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 presented a, a concept of parameterized measure models, um, which takes care of these uh, problems that I encountered, that usually the space of, manif uh, of, of measures does not have a manifold structure. Yeah? And you would like to have some, some kind of manifold structure if you want to do differential geometry. So the idea is very simple. Yeah? I mean, you, you have probability measure. OK, you can, if you rescale them, you don't want to have the, the total mass to be 1. But finite, yeah, that's basically just a rescaling. You get finite measures. Um, this sits inside the space of sine finite measures, I mean, where you're also allowed to assign a negative number uh, for n. Now, why would you do this? Well, the nice thing is that this space here 
is, uh, is a vector space, yeah, because you can add and subtract in particular a finite measure, uh, assign finite measures, which you can, I mean, you cannot uh, uh, subtract probability measures, or I mean, you can, but, but you won't get a probability measure anymore. Um, and uh, this is a subset of this, but it's not open. Yeah, and that's a problem. I mean, if you think of some distribution, you take a probability measure, then you take a very tiny region and make it negative there. That's very close, but it's not no longer probability measure. So this is not like this picture of the simplex suggests. It's not an open subset, but it's nothing. Yeah, it's just some cone. And uh, okay, the nice thing is this is a Banach space, uh, which is equipped with a well. This is a Banach norm. It's called the total variation, and uh, so, why don't we do the following? So, parameterized measure model is some map that goes either into finite measures or into probability measures. And it's Frechet differentiable, uh, if I just regard it as a map between the manifold and a Banach space. Okay? So, that's, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah? And just its image uh, uh, lies in this subset. Okay, so that means I have an interpretation of the differential. So that's then a linear map from this to uh, the Spanner space. Um, and actually, you can very easily see that uh, if uh, you insist uh, the, 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 uh, the P of M to be positive, then the differentials are always dominated by the measure itself. Yeah? Because if you have something that a zero measure, then that's a minimum, and, and then uh, the differential has to vanish there. So that means you take, can take a rather negative derivative, and I define this to be dv of log p, which just has to be an L1 function. So the, the advantage is you, you, you now have a very nice uh, 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 fixed um, notion of, uh, of, of this derivative, even though the log does not exist, because you don't have density functions. Yeah? So that's, that's, uh, that's the, the advantage uh, of this approach is you do not have any measure, um, which is a problem in the, in the setting here, if you just take continuous measures which are um, dominated by the standard smooth measures, then, then you're restricting yourself, which is uh, inconvenient in, in lots of uh, um, uh, situations. And here you don't have to do this. You don't have a, a reference measures, and you cannot make sense out of log p, but you can make sense out of these derivatives. Okay, um, and uh, so here's a little bit of, uh, okay, so this space S of omega is actually, it's, it's a Banach space, but that's about the only nice thing you can say about it, namely it's a nightmare. It's a directed limit of the L1 functions over the set of, uh, of these measures. Yeah, I mean, you can embed uh, L1 of mu1 into mu2 by multiplying by this guy. Um, anyway, so, so it, you can regard it as a directed limit. Um, but actually, you can do something else. Take some number between 0 and 1, yeah, and then uh, you take the limit of 1. So 1 over r will be some number which is bigger than 1. And then you can embed this here into that just in the same way. Yeah? So, uh, so that's the description of s omega. And here's with the r, so you just put 1 over r over here. Yeah? So you get another s r limit. And that's uh, what we call the space of uh, r powers of measures. And you can uh, work with these in a very intuitive way. You can multiply two of them uh, to get another R of measures, if all of these make sense. You can take uh, the power, yeah, uh, the case power of such a measure. You get something in RK. And uh, this map pi K is actually always continuous. And if K is bigger than 1, then it's even differential. So you have a diagram like this. Yeah, from S omega to SR, you get this taking the R's power. That's continuous, but not differentiable. This is even differentiable, because 1 over r is bigger than 1. And uh, it preserves positive measures and probability measures. And uh, so what you can say is that this is k integrable if actually this combination is differentiable. Yeah, OK, so, so p uh, from m to s1 has to be differentiable. But now you uh, compose it with this uh, non-differentiable map, and this still has to be uh, differentiable, so that's um, that's certainly a condition. And uh, then again, you can look at the differential of this. Yeah, this is bounded by that, so this has to be. Uh, you have some rather negative derivative, but this now has to lie in L k, not just in L one. Yeah, so that's uh, that's 
sort of the condition that you get. So, so these logarithmic functions have to be of order LK, and not just of L1. And actually, the, there's a nice criterion, namely you need to, okay, all these have to lie in K1. And then if, if you take the K norm of this, this has to be a continuous function. And that's actually enough. That's essentially the rather and Ries theorem that tells you uh, that this is already enough for this to be a C1 map. Anyway, so, uh, so here's uh, where you get. And on, on this space S1 over N, you actually have a nice n tensor, which we call the canonical n tensor. So you take n of these 1 over n measures. I told you there's a multiplication. So if you multiply n of them, you get something that lies in S of omega. And you can integrate that. You get a real number. You have some cosmetic factor in front. And uh, then you get here a canonical n tensor on this Banner space. OK, and so you can take the pullback, if you have this model that, that goes from m into S1, you can take the pullback of this guy. And you can take the canonical measure of the model. And actually, this gives you the uh, this here. Yeah? OK, that should sound, should look familiar again. OK, so here, here's a formula, once again, of, of this notion. So for m is equal to 1, well, that's just the derivative of the total measure. OK, if you have uh, finite measures, then the measure might vary. Uh, if, if you have a statistical model, then pi of omega is always 1, so that would be 0. But uh, for Tm is equal to 2, that's just the Fisher metric. For Tm is equal to 3, this is the Marichens of tensor. So let me just so you see that we've already seen this. Yeah, yeah so here's, uh, here, here were the two when I, when I calculated for these standard examples. Yeah, though, so that's a 2 tensor, that's a 3 tensor. And why stop there? You also could do this for n. Yeah, and that's uh, what you get here. OK, so we have a very nice and invariant uh, description of these tensors. And uh, OK, and it, it also tells you, yeah, I won't get back to this one. It also it, uh, tells you why you got these, uh, these maps on, in the simplex case by the pullback of taking this root, because that's precisely this map pi to the 1 over k. Yeah, and, and you take that pullback. OK. Um, yeah, OK. So, so now I want uh, this uh, to, to, to show some applications here uh, of this method. So let me explain what a statistics is. Basically, a statistics is a measurable function between two sets. And you should think of this. So, so the, the omega, that's the yellow points. And omega prime, that's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I just indicate uh, all the points here get mapped to 1. These three points get mapped to 2, and so forth. So you can think of this as a partition of your set. Okay? Um, and uh, once you have such a statistics, there's actually something uh, you have to push forward. Yeah, you, you just assign to it a measure on A prime. So if you have, a, if you have some uh, measure on, on the yellow points, then you get a measure on the blue points by just adding uh, what, are, what is the measure of these two, and what is the measure of these three, and what and so forth. Obviously, you lose some information there, yeah, because you, you only know what the points inside this A1 have uh, as total mass, but uh, not what they are independently. So you lose some information. And uh, OK, there's also some more general notion. I won't get into this. And actually, the, that's why the Fisher metric is so important. Um, if you have such a uh, statistics, which is given by density function, that's one of the results that Amari proved, then the Fisher metric is actually submersion. Yeah? So that's, uh, if you take the length of the Fisher metric of the old metal, of the yellow points, and you compare it to the Fisher metric of the blue points, then you actually get some, uh, this inequality, that's a mon monotonicity. Yeah? And uh, in fact, uh, this difference, which is then non-negative, that's interpreted as an information loss. So you can, by taking the statistics, uh, you can actually count how much information do you lose by collecting points together and only looking at the, uh, at the measure of, of these points. Yeah? Uh, you have a, a measure which is actually quite important in statistics. And, well, and we were able to show, well, this works in, in the completely uh, other setting. And in fact, you can... Uh, do it for any k uh, uh, integrable model, for any k bigger than 1. So it doesn't just work for 2. And you get this, uh, this monotonicity formula. 
And uh, so for k equals 2, that is just the Fisher metric, yeah, because for k equals 2, this was exactly what the Fisher metric told you. And uh, so you can also interpret for any k bigger than 1 uh, the k's information loss, but actually it tells you that uh, it either there is the information loss is zero for all k, or it's uh, non-zero for all k. So if it works, uh, so the notion of the sufficiency is not going to be affected. Okay, uh, maybe I will. Yeah. Okay. So so there's. Yeah. No, I, I can I can be brief on this section. So so another uh, thing that is actually quite in, uh, interesting is you can talk about invariant tensors. So you want to have uh, tensors which are invariant under sufficient statistics. So sufficient statistics are those which do not have information loss. Okay. Um, and uh, for example, these canonical tensors that I did before, they are all invariant under sufficient statistics. And uh, okay, once you have these, you can do uh, stupid things, uh, just apply some algebra. Let's say you define a five tensor by this combination. Yeah? Of course, if T3 is uh, invariant and T2 is invariant, then this guy is going to be invariant. And you can take all sorts of tensors. You can take linear combinations of these. So uh, let's call these tensors which are algebraically generated by these. Okay? And uh, in fact, uh, what we could show was that these are actually the only ones which are, um, which are uh, which are characterized by this. So, so any, uh, so these tau n's, these are the only tensors uh, which are invariant under st sufficient statistics. And um, I should mention in uh, order two or three, so that's where the Fisher metric and this Amari Chensov tensor comes from. Uh, this was shown only in the finite case by Chensov <coughs> and uh, in the case of three by Campbell. And uh, actually, we show that it suffices to take. Uh, uh, finite partitions. Yeah? So you map the omega to finite set, and if it's invariant under those, then that already characterizes these. And I should also mention uh, some sort of complementary results. So uh, there's there's also uh, some result by uh, Bauer, Brewers, and Mishawa. So they show uh, if you take a manifold and you only take densities, so that means measures that come from a nice volume form, basically, uh, in the oriented case. Yeah? So um, and, and you want these to be invariant under diffeomorphisms, then uh, the Fisher metric and, uh, is actually the only one that's, uh, uh, that's invariant under these. So that's a nice result. I mean, you only restrict to very uh, uh, specific um, density measures, namely the differentiable densities. But you don't have to need any. You don't need uh, invariance under any statistics, but only under diffeomorphism. Yeah? That's also a nice result. Okay, so that was basically the classical case. So now let me spend uh, the last uh, minutes to to say a little bit about the quantum case. Okay, so this is uh, some joint work again with Jürgen Joost from Leipzig and uh, Florio Cialia uh, from Madrid and. Fabio Sierra, who's also in Leipzig at the moment. Um, okay, so what, what do you do when you do quantum information geometry? Well, you need operators. Yeah? So you start with a complex Banach algebra. So you have a Banach space with a multiplication, which is bilinear and bounded. And you have some involution. Uh, so that means if you, so it's C anti-linear. If you do it twice, you get the same map and it reverts the order. Yeah? And uh, then you have this nice formula that the norm of A dagger times A is the same thing as the norm of A squared. Uh, so these two together, that would be what's called a C star algebra. And what's for W star algebra is uh, A has a pre-dual. That means uh, there is a space so that A is a dual of the space. Yeah, that's sort of the additional thing that comes from, uh, from C star algebra to W star algebra. Okay, well, so what, what's a standard example? That's a von Neumann algebra. So you take uh, a subalgebra of the bounded linear operators of a complex Hilbert space. Yeah, these have uh, so the trace class uh, operators are the pre-dual of this. So th they are exactly of this form. Um, okay, so if you're scared of these operator algebras, let's just do a simple example. Let's take we, uh, let's suppose we have a finite dimensional uh, map. Then this is just the n by n complex matrices. This dagger is the complex conjugation. 
and then the yeah, SA is self adjoint where A is equal to A, A, A dagger, so does the emission N by N matrices. Yeah, so maybe we can just uh, think of this example if you're not so comfortable with infinite dimension spaces. Uh, by the way, this is, uh, is also what's called a Jordan algebra. So you have a linear product, which is just given as a commutator. So that's a symmetric linear product. And it satisfies some, yeah, okay, some identity. Uh, exercise, check this identity for <laughs> uh, Anyway, so, so, it's, so it's a Jordan algebra. Yeah? So it's some symmetric analog of E algebra, if, if you wish. Okay, so for these W star algebra, <coughs> You can split them into the self adjoint and the anti self adjoint maps, which are uh, minus one uh, uh, root minus one times the self adjoint operator. So there's this degree. <laughs> then, uh, like for matrices, a matrix is positive definite if it can be written as A star A, yeah, for some A different from zero. Yeah, so positivity usually means that all the eigenvalues are positive. Well, that's a little bit too much. I just don't want, don't want it to be dead zero. Yeah? So all eigenvalues are non-negative in the finite dimensional case, and it's not the zero matrix. And then this pre-dual, uh, well, you can include this into a double dual, but A star star is A. So that means inside the functions of A, you have a certain subspace. Yeah? And these are called the normal functions. So those are the ones that come from the pre-dual. And finally, we call um, uh, 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 such an operator positive if it's positive on these elements. OK, so here's a dictionary. In the classical case, we have this uh, measure space, omega, with a sigma algebra. And that's what's going to be the W star algebra. Instead of the signed finite measures, you take these normal self-adjoint functionals. So normal, that means the ones that came from the pre-dual. And the finite measures are the normal positive ones. Yeah? So, so these were the signed finite measures where you can have positive and negative uh, uh, values assigned to it. Here you only allow for positive values, and that corresponds to the uh, non-negative condition here. And then probability just corresponds to, to these where the normal fit is equal to 1. So it's just normalizing. OK, so that's basically the dictionary of this. And so you can do basically the same thing. Yeah, you you have uh, probability. I mean, you have this p of omega, and it's contained uh, in some nice Banach space. So why, why not use the same idea of saying that a quantum uh, 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 system is a map which is differentiable, goes to this Banach space, and its values happen to lie in this p one. And so that's exactly uh, what we do. So that's a parametric model of non. Uh, uh, of normal positive linear functionals, M NPLF. Uh, and that's just a map which is uh, Frechet differentiable when we regard it as a map in this higher dimensional banner space. So that's completely analogous to what we did before. And uh, yeah, then the next part of the game was to, uh, to, to try to take these roots of measures. Um, it's not so clear how to do that for, uh, for this algebra, but we can do something, uh, at least for the case one half, so the one where we have this Fisher metric. Namely, if you take a positive element, you, uh, let's, take we, uh, let's say we, we take uh, the following functionals, uh, so, so omega is given, and then for each a, which uh, is self-adjoint, you take this function here. Okay, you take all these uh, j omega. Okay, the, the bracket, that's a Jordan bracket. That's just a commutator. Okay, so that gives you a certain bunch of, uh, uh, of, self uh, of, of uh, operators. And uh, the nice thing is, on this, you have actually a well-defined symmetric form. I mean, the omega of a, b, that doesn't depend on uh, the, the, cho the particular choice. I mean, this is a well-defined uh, product. So that means here you have this jw which actually has an inner product. So it's a pre-Hilbert space. Well, pre-Hilbert space is not so nice. You can complete it. But it still lies in the tangent of this. Yeah? And uh, so what you can interpret this as is you have this Hilbert space. That's sort of the analog of L2 sitting inside L1. Yeah? So that was uh, like the tangent space to P L1 half sits inside the big tangent space. So, uh, and on this one, you have this nice inner product, and uh, you can regard this now as the analog of that. And so we call it two integrable if this differential actually always lies in this nice space. 
j omega, and then you can pull back the metric. Yeah. So, uh, and this is actually uh, something that's called the Boris Boris Hellstrom metric in quantum information. But we we recover this in a very, I would say, natural way. Yeah. The drawback of this is okay. That's a nice idea how to get L two, but what about L3? I mean, do you get some kind of uh, threefold product? Uh, that's something that we haven't succeeded in doing this. Uh, and let me just give you, uh, let's, let's go back to the finite dimension case because that's easier and, and see how all this looks like in, 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 by the n by n matrices. So here we don't have to worry about duality. Yeah? Everything's finite dimensional, everything's canonically identified. So the self-adjoint matrices are the ones that lie here, and uh, we have the Jordan bracket, which is just the commutator, the, the, yeah, the symmetric uh, commutator. Okay, so let's pick an element, uh, and okay, we can diagonalize it. Yeah, it's, it has real uh, entries, and then you look at uh, what is this JA, the space. Yeah, we just have to uh, want to look at this. So the EIJ stand for the uh, standard uh, basis of, of uh, n by n matrices. So it's all the EII where the lambda i is not zero. So though these can be arbitrary numbers. Yeah? And it's uh, these guys uh, where the sum of these two is not equal to zero. Okay, and then uh, on this you have this, uh, this inner product and it's given by this. The, the inner product of these is one of two lambda i. That's why lambda i wasn't allowed to be zero, and the inner product of these two is this, and that's why that wasn't allowed to be zero. Okay, that just comes up, um, and of course in this case you don't have any completion because everything is finite dimensional, so that's that's fine. Um, okay, so nice, we have this calculation, but what, what does it mean? I mean, is there any significance? Um, and the significance is as follows: first of all, this JA is contained in the orbit. Uh, under this canonical GLNC action, yeah, I mean, you, there's an action on the symmetric matrices, which is given by that, yeah, and uh, this is actually, um, uh, uh, yeah, this this is actually something, and and uh, the reason you have to rule out these is because they wouldn't lie in this orbit. Uh, this one, these ones are not quite. Uh, uh, they they also would be in the orbit. You just have to rule them out because yeah, the metric has a singularity. Um, okay, these orbits are uh, open if the matrix is uh, non-degenerate, yeah, because you just have uh, then an open event of the eigenvalues. <coughs> and uh, so this defines a Riemannian metric if and only if the matrix is positive, yeah, because then this here cannot occur. Yeah, and then this is actually, uh, if, if all the lambda i's are positive, uh, greater than or equal to zero, then this here is actually a positive definite matrix. And uh, so let's just say we restrict this to the of, uh, to the diagonal matrices. Yeah. So we don't take all uh, entire matrices, but only the diagonal ones. Then what does it look like? So so you only have the EII. Then it's one over lambda i times the standard metric, and that's just the fischer rao metric. Okay. And what that means is in this quantum system, uh, so so. The diagonal matrix they, they correspond to pure states which don't interact. Yeah, so that's sort of the classical limit. And what you get is that the, this metric G A is just such that if you only restrict to the classical no, no interacting states, you exactly get what you would expect to get, namely the Chevron metric. So that means this seems to be really the uh, the right uh, metric. Um, yeah, okay, and uh, as I said before, the, uh, one of the open problems is can you find something of the Amari Chensov tensor? Yeah, then you would have to have uh, some trial in a tensor. Of course, there's something like the Jordan triple, but that doesn't really work because you don't get anything uh, well defined, so we're not, uh, so that's uh, still a problem we're working on. Uh, yeah, okay, well, so you can you can regard this as some, some analog f of the what you do for Lie algebras, you, you, you get some duality, which is sort of, you get this Kirillov uh, the symplectic form, and that's sort of an analog of this. But let me not uh, explain to this. I think everybody's ready for lunch. So I thank you for your attention. Any questions? 
Yeah, so first of all, you did a terrific job because Amari is not even close <laughs> in clarity with your exposition. So this is... Uh, yeah. uh, so, but the one thing I was uh, concerned is that what happens if the fish uh, is degenerate? Because in many cases in machine learning, this is the case, right? So have you looked at that? I mean, some degeneracy... Well, uh, okay, so, so that's actually the nice thing about our approach is it's the pullback of this thing on S1 half. That's non-degenerate. Yeah? The, the S1 half, that's a Hilbert space and that's yeah. a Hilbert metric. So the reason why the Fisher metric can be uh, 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 degenerate is because you have a, a, a differentiable map from M into that space, which yeah. is not an immersion. And then, of course, uh, yeah, the dif yeah that, that's, that's a problem. I mean... You can interpret the problem by, okay, if you don't have an immersion, then the pullback will have a problem. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so you it, haven't looked at that? Well, we have looked at it. I, I mean, okay, okay. If you don't, I mean, you, you have to somehow perturb it to make it an okay. immersion. But, uh, but I mean, the, the, the advantage is that you, that you can, in complete generality, without uh, restricting to special kinds of density functions or anything, yeah you can interpret the Fisher metric at the pullback of the Silbert metric. And then it's really a matter of how do you embed. Yeah. And, and, as soon as, and, and, and you, you understand what the, what, the, what the problem is. I mean, if, if the differential is not injective, then the pullback will, will be generated. But that's the only case it can be degenerate. Okay. Yeah. So, so the interpretation with the pullback, I think that also give, helps you to, to understand this. But I, I agree, in, in machine learning, uh, they, yeah, if they just write down random formulas, or basically they, they come up with random That's formulas. Right. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and then why should the differential of that random formula be injective? I mean, at random it will be injective because the determinant is non-zero, but uh, okay. there will be points where you have trouble. And uh, exactly. yeah, but, but that's exactly. that's um, but but the, I, I I would say that the problem is clear from from the picture. It's only when you don't have an immersion, but then you don't have a chance. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.